So I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this session. I can't resist the temptation to respond. <laughs> but uh, maybe one thing, uh, uh, one thing I, I, I said I can't resist, and I can't resist, I'm sorry, I can't resist. It's, uh, you, you have the power, yeah. I, I hold the microphone, or actually, this is the microphone. Uh, and, but one, only one thing now, maybe something more later, and this is um, a response basically to Sandy. We had, uh, begin, the first, uh, this fall semester, we had a visiting scholar from India um, by the name of Nitu. And uh, she uh, suggested, after spending a couple of months here, that actually the Mahatma Gandhi is um, um, maybe not the first, but he uh, he developed his own theory of trusteeship, right? And if you look at his theory of trusteeship, according to what um, she provides and what what um, can be read, uh, very uh, it's, it's not very much developed, but it has the same ideas. So this is a southern voice. Um, <laughs> S stating the same principles, right? Um, and on the other hand, we had yesterday uh, Professor Li Ming from China uh, saying, um, presenting a, a different approach, which is state sovereignty is very important st because states are the, the, the building blocks that protect human rights. So we see that, uh, that debate not only in the northern developed rich world, but also in the developing world. Um, with, and there's, I, I don't think there's the, the reason to suspect that there will be different uh, conceptions there as opposed to in the north. But I, I, so this is my non, I, I wasn't able to, uh, to uh, Resist saying uh, that approach, uh, suggesting that uh, perhaps they unknowingly, the first time I encountered uh, this idea of trusteeship is when I was reading uh, Gandhi, and Gandhi influenced my thought a lot when I was growing up. So maybe this is one reason why I uh, went uh, to that, uh, that approach. Question, comments? Thanks. So, 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 so right at the end of your paper, you say, uh, and uh, Alexander ended on this kind of note, that the tools are, that is, uh, these abstract tools, words, are, are uh, used by the strong to better effect than by the weak. And, uh, and then, you, then you, the, the very last line of your paper is that this raises the question whether the, the international order will be more likely to serve the long-term interests of the weaker members of that community when the scope for the use of such tools as sovereign trusteeship is uh, minimized. And when Hanoch commented uh, earlier on uh, Evan's paper, he did say that there were these intrinsic problems with the idea of uh, trusteeship, so that uh, trusteeship in a way seems uh, open for abuse, in a, perhaps in a way that other, other terms that we might think of are uh, not as open uh, to abuse. And, and I wondered whether here there might be some kind of hint. I, I, I hate to keep invoking this person, but I can't get away from him, Cole Schmidt. Right, so, so, you know, so, so, so Schmidt was very, well, he was a completely disingenuous person, but he claimed to be very worried about uh, the kind of moralizing discourse of uh, liberal international law, because he thought it just gives uh, strong nations the pretext to impose their will on others. So his view was get, get rid of all moralizing discourse, just talk about things in terms of uh, interests. And uh, w if we have this kind of really flat kind of realist description of the international order, it will actually be, morally speaking, a better kind of order than if we allow these liberals to come in with their terms like trusteeship and so on. Now, now others here, uh, the non schmittians here, like, of course, Evan, yeah. both Evans. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 no, <laughs> no, not at all. Al, perhaps I've got a lot of, a lot of people together. Me, you know, we have a rather, I think, romantic view of law. And and what is our romantic view of law? We, we actually think that law provides us with a vocabulary where the weak can use tools against the strong. So 
so that we can actually turn the tables a bit, that law provides us with these sorts of tools. And, and, and I wonder whether you could just comment on this uh, set of ideas that I've thrown at you. It's not really a question. Well, no, I mean, I, 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 that's pretty interesting. I can't, the thing about power, I, I can't go as far as so to respond also to, to Alexander. I can't go so far as to think about hegemony in quite that way because when I look at the history of the law of nations, uh, it seemed to me to be employed against a background of really fractured interests. So the thing that brought me to uh, rejecting a lot, not all you know, post-colonial theorists fall into this, and, it, and it's not only post-colonial theorists, I don't think Richard Tuck would see himself as a post-colonial theorist, but my concern with that, that critique of the kind of inherent disposition of certain ideas serving certain interests is that the, the interests, that, that, that it's led to uh, uh, ignoring a very long tradition uh, uh, of um, uh, anti-imperial thought in Europe and the use of the law of nations to push an anti-imperial critique. And that that anti-imperial critique was was also um, connected to knowledge and power. The, the you know I'm not talking about an anti-imperial cr critique run by which has always been there by the the, the moral uh, busybodies um, who usually one way or another end up being apologists for empire. I'm talking about people who opposed empire because it didn't suit very didn't suit their very powerful interests. So there is a very long tradition of critiquing empire in terms of fears of corruption, uh, war, debt, and, and a threat to liberty in Europe. And that, to, that critique is, is connected to very strong interests, interests who put, if you like, the, the people who put their, their own individual or interest or the interest of the state before those of empires. And the history of empires is much more attention. I mean, that's just one fracture. And the history of empire is a tension, I see it as a tension between those competing interests. And the law of nations was used by the different sides in, in that competition. So to come to your kind of op optimistic way of thinking about um, international law, I, that, that's why I say I think international law and, and its various doctrines and concepts are tools because you can look at a very long history of exactly the same ideas such as rights or sovereignty being used for completely contradictory purposes. If you do respond to other comments by saying Right, well, to respond to other comments by saying, I mean, so that, 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 I think that take that as, 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 as the, the, the central point. I mean, on, on the question of Vittoria, uh, which kind of comes to this as well, how do you, how do you read Vittoria? I mean, I, I, I'm and what did Victoria really think? Uh, there's a very good article by Marty Koskinemi, The Real Spanish Contribution. Uh, I can't remember the rest of the title. It's out in the last couple of years. Uh, in which he says, well, let's get beyond this debate about whether he was pro or anti-imperial as such. Let's talk about the, these Spanish theologians. Um, what... Uh, what ideas that did they create that were used to justify empire without necessarily setting out to justify empire? And, and he says, you know, the crucial terms are the, the idea of dominion, um, just war, and the law of nations. And it's the combination of these things that leads to you know, 500 years of, of, of various kinds of European um, domination of the non European world uh, without Victoria necessarily setting out to do that. But if I, you ask me what Victoria really thought, um, no, actually I didn't ask. That. Okay, right. Well, so that's what I. Okay. Well, I mean, because what, what interests me is how he's read, and and the, you know the, we will find people like Pufendorf who saw him as an apologist uh, for empire and, and was really strongly critical of him, and yet there are people you know say for example the Virginia Company who saw in Victoria a serious obstacle to what they were trying to do. They said, "Look, this is uh, the, the, this discussion of rights in, uh, by these uh, Salamanca theologians is is a serious problem for us. We can't. We just 
be better, better avoiding the whole question of the justice, justice of empire because it's going to get us into all kinds of trouble. Uh, I mean, they then change their mind about that. But that is, I mean, the 19th century jurists saw these theologians as opposed to empire. Um, you know, there's the, the, Vittoria is just extraordinarily ambivalent. Um, so we have uh, four hands, and so we'll begin, let's uh, come back to uh, Olga and then uh, Ivan Foxes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very interesting paper. And uh, while I was reading it, I was trying to think about ways distinguishes, distinguishing between the dangerous ways the, the, that those arguments are, are used uh, versus the ways that I think Yael is trying to promote uh, that they should be used. And I was trying to, and the conclusion that I came from, uh, to, and I wonder what you think about it, is that maybe there are three criteria that we can use to look at it. So it's territory, the way, the type of obligations, and the enforcement. So basically, the first question is, is the obligation or the action is inside the territory of the state that is arguing for the obligation or the action or outside it? Basically, is the country, is the state is arguing for something that it should do within the territory or outside its territory? And maybe we should be less suspicious if it's inside the territory rather than when it's outside then uh, the type of obligation, whether it's an action or a limitation on action, whether the, the country is, or the state is, uh, is arguing that it should do something that is influencing other, whether it should um, uh, not do something if, because it may risk. Uh, mm -hmm. And the third thing is uh, the enforcement. So whether the, con the state is enforcing it, the obligation or the, uh, on itself, or whether is someone else from outside or the international order is arguing that that uh, that, that actor should uh, act upon it. So basically, if someone else is arguing that there is an obligation, or whether the the actor itself, the state itself, uh, accept the obligation. And I think that if we are talking about action that happens inside the territory. Uh, that is uh, limitations on the actions inside the territory and are self-enforced, maybe we should be less suspicious uh, to those actions or those obligations and to other actions and obligations. I mean, I, I agree with um, that. I, and I, you know, on, on the question of... Should I answer? Yeah. Yeah, or do you want me to take you a few? already started, so... Yeah, okay, and also there's three questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, just on the, uh, okay, so, so uh, I think it's yes, yes, and yes. The, the territory, um, well, actually, I, know, I don't know for obligations inside and outside of territory. I mean, I, you know, I'm a historian of empire, so the, the, I'm always being concerned with actions outside. Uh, the state, uh, having said that, uh, you know, as states, as I have studied them, have always understood themselves to have obligations um, that go beyond their, their boundaries. Uh, this is nothing new. Um, I think the, 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 the clearly the strongest uh, case would be for, for not doing things, so not polluting uh, water which runs into, you know, another country, or not polluting air that uh, is then going to go into another country. I mean, this seems to me to be the strongest case for this idea of trusteeship, yes. Uh, and the third one, um, enforcement. enforcement. Can you say it very briefly again? Yeah, Whether, so I was thinking more about the new, what's the new obligation? Basically, if the person is enforcing the obligation upon itself, or is trying to, or someone else is trying, or the state or the entity is on itself, or is it trying to enforce on others? So basically, if right. You don't mm. um, doesn't that, I mean, it seems to me to come cross over with the second one in some ways. But um, I mean, the, the, all of these questions, I, you know, I, 
know, I feel a little bit like, like Mira when she was asking questions. I'm an historian, and, uh, <laughs> and we're in a kind of normative realm that is very unfamiliar to me. I'm used to deconstructing these yeah. ideas. But you, in, all your example, in all your example, the, the mm. trustee, so to speak, the self-appointed mm. trustee, never mm. asked questions mm. and, uh, the, and expected answers mm. from the mm. beneficiary, so, so called, right? It was only silencing the beneficiary, right? So I think uh, in it, maybe in addition to what Olga just said... That's not how they represented uh, it. Sorry? That's not how they represented it. Yeah, but did they ever ask people... Did they offer hearing? They often said they did. They often said they did, but mm. did they? Ah, well... Did they call for, communi <laughs> call for communicative action, as uh, mm. uh, surgeons mm. said? This, mm. this is the idea. Mm. The opening up to uh, communication uh, mm. uh, by... Uh, by bidirectional or multidirectional mm. communication, mm. this may be the best uh, mm. uh, I, uh, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. way procedure to prevent uh, this. Mm. Uh, mm. But the, 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 I agree. I mean, I'm just saying, in uh, almost invariably, all of these uh, justifications came with the claim: these yes. people want us to do. You know, they've asked us to do this for them. I mean, whether they, these people but did or not is, uh, is another question. I mean, that's actually more complicated. Do you have an course. example where the people, people asking get, get, got an answer and disregarded it? Well, the whole issue of uh, uh, having, if I can take mm. all the treatises, in a way, can be mm. kind of uh, mm. ongoing mm. communication mm. and seemingly mm. reaching an agreement, but mm. in relation, in, in very differential power, mm. uh, power situations. So. Uh, if, for example, uh, the work of Stuart Bonner on uh, mm. New Zealand as an example of seemingly it was even free will. I mean, there was, uh, you know, they b sold their land, but then he analyzes and show how essentially the power relationship was so strong that they didn't really have a choice. Mm. Or, uh, so, but, so, so they were. And if I can just, and the issue is not just to hear. The question is who, who is hearing, and who is deciding. You know, so it's a different. It's not just just that you have a, this kind of communication, and then a benign person sits and decides whether to accept or is. But but the question is the interrelation between power and knowledge, which is also respond to what you said about the Indian <laughs> who came here. To you. <laughs> and the table. So what's, 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 the, what's, the answer, what's the response? I don't understand the response. I will elaborate. Uh, yeah. All right, thanks very much. So uh, I thought David was going to ask a different question than he did. And I was getting depressed when he uh, pointed to what you said toward the end of the paper. Because uh, for uh, uh, those of us of a particularly uh, romantic uh, bent, to refer to uh, you know the conventions of political thought or uh, the trusteeship idea as uh, just a tool is to uh, evoke um, Raz's understanding of law, that it can be used one way, it can be used the other, but there's nothing really special about law per se. There might be nothing really special about the trusteeship idea per se. Um, so on one, in, on one interpretation of the trusteeship idea, it's a, uh, uh, it's a particular manifestation of what David elsewhere has referred to as the compulsion of legality. That is the idea that we need law so that people can relate to each other as equals. Without law, the, the, the option is no law, this sort of Schmidian, it's just interests, and we know who wins in that contest. The strong always win, right, where the strong are only limited by their own interest. So the compulsion of legality, as I understand it, is this idea that we have to set up institutions where people can, will, uh, will reliably be treated um, as equals. Um, as participant and potentially as participants within those institutions itself. Now, this goes now to, this, the, to the conversation that uh, we were just having. Um, is there any hope for this romantic idea? I think the indigenous case, the modern indigenous case, does provide some um, some tentative ground for hope, and in a couple of ways. The main way is that indigenous peoples, through the representatives at the UN, through the ILO, in different ways, actually in those. Fora 
relate to states as equals, right? When they're, when they're uh, negotiating these draft conventions, the, the Declaration on uh, Indigenous Persons, and also when, when they show up before regional courts, such as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. They're again treated as equals vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis state parties, where otherwise, you know, they might not be treated, uh, they might not be treated that way at all. In terms of what extent are they appropriating these sort of means to themselves, uh, just as a comment, uh, the, the whole, the history of the Sarayaku case is, is fascinating. And um, I exhausted the full, uh, uh, the full extent of my research skills by Googling Sarayaku and learning about it. And that's all, that's all it takes. And you get, they have their own website and they talk about the history of the case, how they became part, how they were sort of uh, embraced by a transnational indigenous movement that is something sort of like a collective version of the human rights movement, if you will, um, and then began to become involved with the Inter-American Human Rights Commission that then takes their case through its procedure to the Inter-American Human Rights Court. So, uh, you know, whether that you know, is enough, who knows, but it's, uh, it's something. Thanks, Andrew. Um, three quick questions. Uh, first, you said something about you depart from other views of uh, Australian or other uh, settler societies, and you just left it at that. Uh, and I wondered about you know some key names that you haven't mentioned, like Derek Moses and Patrick Wolf or uh, Henry Reynolds. Whether you depart from them or you depart from other views uh, of uh, Australian colonialism, or what is the departure? Second, uh, something that intrigued me, you talked about uh, the difference between terra nullius and territorial nullius. Sunday and I are now writing about a, a, a book that ha will have terra nullius in its title. So, and then, um, like Evans, I, I used my Google ability, and I, there is no, in the Google, there is no territorial nullius as, as uh, so I'd like to, a little bit of elaboration uh, What's, and to Sandy, um, you talked about uh, John Marshall. Isn't there a way from John Marshall, say, to the Mabo case, which, which maybe gives some credit to uh, Eyal ben Benishti's concept that, you know, perhaps willy-nilly, without grand design, there is an idea of trusteeship, uh, trusteeship that uh, people do take some kind of responsibilities that didn't exi exist before. Uh, okay, three quiz quick questions. Doreen, and then we uh, give the last words. Oh, very short. Um, I think we're, we've gotten into an age-old debate over uh, the use of, of concepts, normative concepts, in this case it's liberal internationalist concepts, and whether they uh, are enabling um, of domination and actually block, because, it, because of the ideology effect, uh, block uh, critique um, and challenges because they, you know, uh, they, they sort of cover over or whether it's better to have, not, to dispense with these kinds of concepts. But on the other hand, and I, I can't remember the name of the person, it's driving me crazy, she's a political theorist from India in Yale, she has a book on liberal empire, what, thank you, yes. Karuna Mantegna, God, don't tell her I couldn't remember it. Karuna Mantegna, so she has an interesting discussion of um, the liberal justifications of empire, the civilizing mission, all of that, and then, and then when this was dropped, pure racist, they are inferior, that's it, we're just taking over. So uh, I'm not convinced that that's uh, better. a little bit um, the anti-idealist mode that kind of captured uh, some aspects of the, the conversation and I, I see an essentialist aspect and a romanticized uh, um, view in, in conceiving the liberating potential of social movements or the idea that the South may have an understanding that could actually destabilize the North just by conceiving it as such. So I actually am a little bit unease with, 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 with kind of essentializing or romanticizing 
um, the, the, these kind of um, practices as such, I, can, I consider them to be as both. So I think ideas are always embedded in practices and practices are always embedded in ideas and I, 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 I kind of not, I, 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 I don't think the, that kind of resisting the tension and trying to think that by bringing practice into the table things would necessarily change. Everything is intertwined in some ways or another. And, and, and then that's one, my, one point I wanted to make. And the second one had to do with empire reaching out and, the, and sovereigns reaching out. So in some ways, what we're now seeing, and that's actually the, the contingency of this particular, particular moment in which, and I think historians cannot, cannot really escape from, from looking at themselves and the kind of agency they have in, in this discourse. So Mir, when you're writing uh, an, an essay on the cosmopolitan moment in the interwar period, so let me be like an external viewer now. So you're kind of joining forces with many other friends of mine and myself included who are now looking back at the League of Nations as a very important moment in, in international legal history. And we're actually kind of rediscovering international legal history right now. And that's the moment. So that the fact that we are actually looking at this particular moment in history now has a normative dimension to it and is, at, or at, at the very least, says something about the contingencies or the circumstances of our present and so I think that's actually very interesting. What is it now? So in, in some ways, I invite mm. historians to, to, to think about that. So even if not as in normative terms, in metanorm, in kind of a, the, meta, the meta question, what's going on that historians are now so, and so we're not alone. We're, it's, there are a few of us. So, and, and it's not us vis-a-vis -vis the lawyers. It's lawyers are engaging in this ideology in those ideas, practice of ideas, practice ideas, or the, or uh, uh, and we and and the others who are doing a more history are looking back at particular moments. So in your book, you're looking at the uh, at, at these concepts, but you're actually bringing up the nuance and the right the poten the positive potential of some of the concepts. Mm -hmm. So so the, the 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 book is is this kind of very complicated history that kind of opposes the postcolonial. Absolutely. Um, uh, features. So, anyway, I wanted to bring that to the table as well. I think I can answer the questions by, with, with one answer, um, I in a way. So, yes, I'm, I'm engaged with the normative world. I mean, I, I began working on this question in 19, this question of occupation in 1996, shortly after the Mabo um, judgment in Australia. Uh, which granted a limited uh, uh, um, understanding of, of, of land rights to, to Aboriginal peoples. Um, but I, and I, so I, my interest in the Marlborough Judgment was the use of this term terra nullius. So coming to this question about terra nullius and other Australian historians, um, I'm a contextualist historian trained in the Cambridge School of Political Thought by Quentin Skinner, and so I took a very particular approach to these questions. So I begin with a normative um, thing, which is this doctrine of terra nullius and, 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 and its incredibly uh, important place in Australian debate in, in the 1990s and, and subsequently. Um, uh, but then I went about to try and understand the vocabulary that we use to think about this question. And one of the first things I discovered was that terra nullius uh, was, was not a doctrine used to justify uh, the colonization of Australia, uh, contrary to the High Court judgment, uh, in the sense that the term was never used. Of course, occupation was employed, uh, but terra nullius wasn't employed in the law of nations, as I mentioned earlier, prior to the 1890s. So my difference with uh, other Australian historians, such as Henry Reynolds, say Dirk Moses, is you know, Henry Reynolds will talk about terra nullius as this kind of transcendent thing. I look at history in a different way. Dirk Moses would look at, you know, talks, for example, talks about genocide and 
and various empires. I don't think we can talk about genocide after uh, prior to Raphael Lemkin coining the term in what 1943. Um, I think we can talk about other things, extermination, part of that point. But you know, I look at concepts having particular responding to particular concept contexts, uh, which comes back to um, Evans' question about uh, tools. Uh, I, I, tools or arguments. I, I look at the things that you call laws um, as, <laughs> as, as arguments, uh, which respond, uh, and I look at them in a Wittgensteinian way as, as speech acts responding to particular contexts. Very briefly. Very briefly. Just, um, I think uh, I didn't say that there is, should be practice and I think that these things are embedded, that's the first thing. And uh, in response to Oren, yes, I think that within Mabu, you had already possible seeds, uh, sorry, with, within uh, uh, Marshall's uh, Johnson versus Magitash, you already had possible ambiguities that could be used to construct Mabu. But you had to have somebody with an agenda. and. Uh, Peter McGill uh, is detailing this kind of construction, of constructing a certain way. But for us as uh, lawyers, this is the way common law works always. I mean, common law always somehow discover in the past things in order to use them and say that they were always there. It's not something very peculiar. Uh, but again, we come back to the question of who is on the table, who, who has the power to decide. And here I completely disagree with you, Eyal. If Victoria was sitting and uh, hearing some indigenous people coming and telling you some, him some stories, but still he was the one who had the power to write his books and treat his, uh, not his book, his uh, lectures. But uh, he could do it. Then the fact that he heard this would not have made, according to my view, a big difference. Maybe slightly, but not a big difference. Because uh, he came from a, a, a different uh, direction and with different agendas. Or, but I, I agree with what you said, that there are, there are fissures within the elites, mm. but these fissures are sometimes very different from the, fe the, 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 the struggles that are among indigenous people. They are not the same one. We need to close them. Just one, before closing, I just want to refer to the blog post by Nitu, uh, uh, where she writes that Gandhi, in 1939, with reference to colonialism and independence, uh, writes that my trusteeship concept will survive all other theories. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we, uh, <laughs> we can thank uh, Andrew and Sandy. <laughs> <laughs>